Imagine a dimly lit basilica, the air thick with incense and dread. The atmosphere is heavy, almost suffocating, as the scent of burning incense mingles with the palpable tension that fills the room. The dim light barely illuminates the grand arches and intricate stonework, casting an eerie glow that seems to dance with the shadows. Candles flicker, casting long shadows on the mosaic walls. The flickering flames create a mesmerizing dance of light and shadow, making the ancient mosaics appear almost alive. Each candle, a small beacon of light in the overwhelming darkness, adds to the surreal and haunting ambiance of the basilica. Before a stunned audience, a gruesome spectacle unfolds. The onlookers, a mix of clergy, nobility, and common folk, are frozen in a state of shock and disbelief. Their faces, illuminated by the dim candlelight, reflect a range of emotions from horror to morbid curiosity. They have gathered here, not for a celebration or a sermon, but for a macabre trial that defies all norms and expectations. A dead pope, exhumed and dressed in papal finery, sits propped on a throne. His lifeless body, adorned in the rich and ornate vestments of his office, is a grotesque parody of the living. The sight is both tragic and absurd, a stark reminder of the fleeting nature of power and the lengths to which men will go to assert their dominance. This was no nightmare, but the reality of the Cadaver Synod, a bizarre trial that shook the foundations of the medieval church. The Cadaver Synod, or Synodus Horrenda, as it came to be known, was an event so shocking and unprecedented that it would be remembered for centuries. It was a moment when the boundaries between the sacred and the profane were blurred, and the very essence of justice was called into question. The year is 897 AD. Europe is a land of turmoil and transition where the power struggles of the church and the state often intersect in violent and unpredictable ways. The political landscape is as volatile as the shifting sands, with alliances forming and dissolving in the blink of an eye. Pope Stephen VI, driven by a thirst for vengeance and power, has ordered the exhumation of his predecessor, Pope Formosus. Stephen's motivations are complex, a tangled web of personal vendettas, political maneuvering, and a desire to solidify his own position. By putting Formosus on trial, even in death, Stephen seeks to discredit his rival and erase his legacy. Formosus, dead for seven months, is accused of perjury, violating canon law, and coveting the papacy. The charges are as grave as they are absurd, a testament to the lengths to which Stephen will go to achieve his aims. Formosus, unable to defend himself, is represented by a deacon who speaks on his behalf, a surreal and macabre twist in an already bizarre scenario. His accuser? The very man who now sits on the throne of St. Peter. Stephen VI, in his quest for retribution, has turned the sacred seat of the papacy into a stage for his own vendetta. The trial, a grotesque spectacle, is as much about asserting his authority as it is about condemning Formosus. It is a moment that will leave an indelible mark on the history of the church, a dark chapter that speaks to the depths of human ambition and the complexities of power. To understand this macabre event, we must delve into the tumultuous world of 9th century papal politics. Formosus, before his papacy, had been embroiled in power struggles within the church. He had switched allegiances, crowning a rival king, and generally making enemies within the Roman elite. Stephen VI, a puppet of this Roman faction, saw an opportunity to solidify his own shaky grip on power. What better way than to utterly discredit his predecessor, even if that meant putting a corpse on trial? The charges against Formosus were largely politically motivated, stemming from his past actions and the ambitions of his enemies. The trial itself was a grotesque affair. A deacon was appointed to speak for the deceased Formosus, forced to answer for the crimes of a rotting corpse. Witnesses were called, accusations hurled, and throughout it all, the silent, decaying Formosus presided over the proceedings. The very act of putting a corpse on trial shocked even the most hardened observers. It flew in the face of Christian beliefs about death and the sanctity of the body. Yet, driven by political expediency and personal vendetta, Stephen VI disregarded all norms of decency and religious sensibility. Unsurprisingly, the trial concluded with a guilty verdict. Formosus was posthumously stripped of his papal title, his fingers used for blessings were chopped off, and his body was dragged through the streets of Rome before being dumped in the Tiber River. However, the macabre spectacle backfired spectacularly. 
The Roman populace, horrified by the trial and its aftermath, rose up in revolt. Stephen VI was imprisoned and later strangled to death, his papacy cut tragically short. The ghost of Formosus, it seemed, had exacted its revenge. The Cadaver Synod is often presented as an example of the Church's barbarity and the excesses of medieval power. While these interpretations hold weight, they also risk simplifying a complex historical event. The trial was not merely an act of religious fanaticism but a product of its time, a time of political instability and ruthless power struggles. Moreover, the very fact that the trial was so shocking to contemporaries suggests that it was not representative of normal church practice. Indeed, even in an era accustomed to violence and political intrigue, the Cadaver Synod stood out as an act of exceptional cruelty and absurdity. The trial also offers a glimpse into medieval conceptions of justice. The idea that a corpse could be held accountable for its earthly actions may seem ludicrous today, but in a world where the afterlife loomed large, the boundary between the living and the dead was more porous. The Cadaver Synod, for all its absurdity, highlights the very real power of the church in medieval society. It controlled not only spiritual matters, but also wielded significant political and legal authority. The trial, in a twisted way, reflected the church's all-encompassing reach. The Cadaver Synod remains a stain on the papacy, a stark reminder of the human failings of those who have occupied the throne of St. Peter. It also reveals the dangers of unchecked power and the corrosive effects of political ambition. The event tarnished the image of the papacy, contributing to a growing sense of discontent and skepticism towards papal authority. It served as a cautionary tale about the abuse of religious power and the need for restraint and accountability. Some historians argue that the Cadaver Synod marked a turning point in the history of the papacy, ushering in an era of increased instability and decline. Others see it as an isolated incident, a grotesque anomaly in an otherwise turbulent period. Regardless of its long-term impact, the Cadaver Synod serves as a stark reminder of the complexities of history and the dangers of imposing modern sensibilities on the past. It challenges us to understand the event within its own historical context, however alien or unsettling it may seem. Though separated from us by over a millennium, the Cadaver Synod still holds relevance today. It reminds us of the fragility of institutions, the seductive allure of power, and the enduring human capacity for cruelty and folly. In a world still grappling with issues of religious extremism, political corruption, and the abuse of power, the lessons of the Cadaver Synod resonate with unsettling clarity. It serves as a cautionary tale, urging us to be vigilant against the misuse of authority and the erosion of justice and human dignity. The Cadaver Synod, in all its macabre absurdity, forces us to confront the darker side of human nature and the often convoluted path of history. It is a story of power, revenge, and the enduring struggle for control over both the living and the dead. As we reflect on this bizarre episode from our distant vantage point, we are left with a sense of unease and a lingering question. Could such an event ever happen again? The answer, perhaps, lies not in the annals of history, but in our own capacity for both good and evil, and dip.